welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Welcome back to a new episode of Sports Management Podcast. Before I introduce today's guest, I just want to let you know that Sports Management Podcast will continue to be released every other Monday all through the summer. No breaks. So make sure to subscribe to the podcast in order not to miss out on any new episodes. And there are some great ones in the pipeline. With that said, today's great guest is David Diaz. He is a partner at Baker McKenzie and heads up both the Employment and Conversation Department as well as the Sports Law Practice in their office in Madrid. As head of sports law, Diaz holds extensive experience in this area, particularly in the football industry. Specifically, he regularly advises professional athletes and clubs in all the matters related to negotiations of contracts, transfer and its compensation schemes. He also has a wide experience in assisting foreign investors with interest in the European football industry. Get ready to learn how employment differs between the sports business and other sectors why purchasing a Spanish football club is a good investment, and why you should never change the terms you have written on a napkin. Here is episode 49 with David Diaz. David Diaz, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you today. You are a partner at Baker McKenzie in uh, Madrid. So can you tell us a little bit about the firm and uh, what you do there? Yes, I'm based in Madrid. Um, I'm the partner of, uh, for, and head of the employment and the sports group here in Madrid and also leading the global sport group of the firm. We are a U.S. multinational law firm, probably the largest, and we are basically... No, I will not say multinational, I would say global. Uh, we are in more than 50 countries and we have offices almost spread across the world. And, uh, and we basically help to navigate the clients in the complex landscape that we have now, all type of clients, and we are a, a full-fledged law firm. That's very interesting. And as you mentioned there, you have a background in employment law and you're also now the head of sports law practice at... Baker McKenzie. So how does the employment differ between the sports industry and uh, outside? Well, I think that it's, um, I think it's very interesting coming from the employment law background to the sport. I think it's a natural way because at the end, many of the athletes and, and football players, they are in many countries, employees, obviously, special employees but they're employees. So I think that it is very, it's very interesting to see how you apply all the general employment law for the ordinary relationship between employees and employers and how you need to make the change and the click when it comes to players. Because in spite of the fact that they are also employees in a way, obviously they have a special needs, special legal frame in many countries. And, and it's an industry with a, uh, quite a specific frame and network so uh, i think it's it's it comes naturally but you need to make the twist in the right time when you reach the the sports industry i understand that and could you take some specific examples on uh, what differs so for example the careers are much shorter obviously than if you work in some other fields maybe if you're an athlete for example if you work in sports in other ways maybe you have longer but also if it's an athlete, maybe injuries or what are some aspects that differ, you would say? Well, I think that the, the regulation in many countries is special for athletes and for football players, just to, to give the example. And it's basically related to the fact that the careers are shorter, um, as opposed to a general employee who is the general interest of the law to have a stable, a long career in a company, in the players and the football players specifically, the regulation trends to release and to promote the freedom of the player to move from one club to the other. I think that's, that's one of the main features and, and that transpires in the, entire, in the entire regulation. Also, the ability of the football player to terminate the contract earlier if there's a potential transfer. And at least in Spain, 
uh, having um, an, a specific buyout clause established in the contract. I think that's something pretty specific. And then the, the legal uh, provisions when it comes to severance payments, it's a slightly different. There is a minimum on the for the um, uh, football players, but there is a lot of room for the contractual agreements between the club and the players to to agree on that. So I would say that it's it's a more flexible legal frame, but tailor made to the specific needs of both uh, clubs and athletes. Are we talking now uh, football in specific, or uh, are you working also across other sports? We mainly work for the football industry. Hmm. We have done uh, some other things for, like for example, for tennis, badminton, uh, futsal. But our core business in sport is related uh, to football for very obvious reasons. Um, in this big industry, there are a lot of stakeholders and players which could be interesting for us as potential clients. And, and in my case, I'm based in Spain. And obviously, there is a huge impact of football in Spain as an industry. I'm of a Spanish football abroad and in the global industry. So it came also uh, naturally. And, and I think we were in the right place. At the firm, you have been a partner there since 2004, if I'm correct. When did the sports part start? So I joined the firm in 1999. And in the beginning, I was only focusing on my employment law practice. But I love sport. I'm a sport fan and I love to practice sport. And since the beginning, it was very clear to me that the, the sport industry and the football industry had a legal needs that we as a firm could easily satisfy. And we were absolutely well positioned for that. So um, it took me a number of years to try to, to build a practice here, try to get the traction internally for the decision makers to understand that there is a business there and that we could serve this business uh, in the same way that we serve all the big companies or all the clients. So that was the beginning. And, and I think more or less around 2006 is when we started to get our first assignments and to put in place the team. And, uh, and we took it from there. Interesting. And uh, the sports department now at the firm, how big is that that you're heading up? How many are you a lot of people working on the sports? Yeah, we have we have more than 10 uh, sport law practitioners. Uh, I think that the approach that a lot of them need to take with the sport law practice has to be holistic in a way that the needs of, of the clients in that industry may be related to taxation, may be related to IP rights, to employment to real estate. So at the end, you need to have um, a team with different uh, practitioners and lawyers from different areas of practice to make sure that you are able to cover all the needs that the client will have. Of course. And you are the law firm and some other stakeholders are the obviously the players, there are teams, there are agents. So how is this collaboration working between uh, all of these parties? Well, that's, that's interesting. I think that the first headline here is that we thought that we should provide our services in terms of quality, speed of response, in the same way as we provide our legal services to other clients. So we thought, and that was our vision, that we could provide a, a level of uh, professionalism and excellence to the, to the clients which had to be exactly the same that we apply to non-sport industry clients. Because I think that clearly the sport industry, it's going through a journey, probably accelerated over the last three, four years on governance and on having professional resources and teams managing the clubs. And, and I think that is something that is absolutely aligned with the way that we see the industry and the way that we can serve it. Um, in this regard, we, we typically work for agents, players, and teams. And, and also, I will mention later some projects that we do, for example, for investors. And, and in the case of agents, I mean, in the beginning, we realized that agents could be a great so source of, of work for us. I mean, a good starting point. And that was the beginning of the practice, uh, literally. So we noticed that the approach that the agents had to players could be upgraded if we are a partner. 
I think that the value proposition of the agent to the player could be enhanced and upgraded, as I mentioned, and could be a differentiator between one agent and the other. And I think it was very important for the agents to understand that and to understand that we are not competing with them, Mm. but just adding value to the proposition that they have to the players. And I think that we start working with that approach. It worked. Obviously, in, in the beginning, not all the agents perceive the value that we could brought. But once that we start working with some of them, I think the, um, the word of mouth uh, worked pretty well. And, and when you have credential, you have track record, and you have this clear vision, and, and you are able to explain that you are here to help, not to compete, because we are lawyers, we are not agents. Um, I think there is a, a tipping point, and that triggers a conversation that has been, uh, for us, extremely successful. At the end, we are a sport industry, and football industry is a global market. Players can go from Uruguay to Australia and from Spain to the Emirates. So I think that we have the global platform, but with the nuance of the local knowledge and, and, the, and the knowledge of the industry. Um, the other group of clients are teams. Many of the La Liga teams, uh, we've been working with them and we work with them on a regular basis. Uh, top clubs, mid-class and also working class clubs with different needs, uh, different, uh, I think obviously there's a common ground on the industry and the football industry in Spain, but different needs depending on, on the project that they have and what they can afford in terms of growth on and, and off the pitch. And I think it has been very interesting to see how um, La Liga clubs are going through a significant transformation, especially over the last seven years. And now after COVID, with the new deal between La Liga and CBC, who's really transforming and boosting the next, I think, five, seven years of the Spanish clubs. And we have also worked with um, some uh, UK clubs, especially in the frame of transfers from Spanish players to the Premier League. We also advise um, one European club, and it was very interesting, in the joint venture with um, Indian investor uh, in the beginning of the Indian ISL. That was uh, really interesting to see the interaction, the project for that league, and what could be the benefits for our client and the the Indian franchise in, in the league. And the other pillar of our practice are foreign investors, typically high net worth individuals. We help them to understand the market in Spain, the challenges and, and the opportunities, and again, to help them to navigate through the local football industry, calibrating the risk, but help, helping them to understand what is it owning and running a club in Spain. Mm. And I think that's very important. I mean, because there's a lot of challenges, the financials, the legal, the commercial potential, in many times I'm leashed by the club and also the risk, starting with the risk of relegation, which is something absolutely unrelated to, for example, uh, an American US-based investor. So, so I think we, we held them to, to understand all these, but it's also very important to understand why is the investor taking this opportunity? Why the investor wants to buy a club, whether it's a personal investment because he likes and he loves football, which is absolutely fine. Uh, in other cases, we're talking about multi-club platforms to have the benefit of, of having different clubs across the, the globe with opportunities of synergies, and not only in transfer, but also in the operation of the club more generally, or if just an, an investment for a limited period of time. So to understand what is the approach that the investor wants to have for this given opportunity, I think, uh, help us to tailor made and to focus on what could be the project once the acquisition is completed. And, and, it's, and it's really, I mean, very interesting because you sometimes see things that uh, with the eyes of the investor that you have not thought before, you know, I mean, the relegation may seem very obvious, but this is something that is the way the, the football competitions are in the national leagues. But for example, the fact that in many cases, at least in Spain, the club is not the owner of the stadium. So the question from a typical US investor will be, okay, so I'm going to buy a club who plays 
in a stadium which belongs to the city. I mean, on the other hand, obviously, you can have a 50 or 70 years loan from the city, but, you know, the U.S. investor that used to own and operate the stadium with absolutely freedom. Here, you may have some limitations from the loan agreement with the city. Wow, that's so interesting. And uh, so many things I want to uh, talk about on those topics. But first of all, with owning their stadiums, is that the case for all La Liga teams or most Spanish teams that the state owns the stadiums or do some of the team own their own? I mean, there's some of the teams that they own. I mean, we're talking about Barcelona, we're talking about Atlético de Bilbao, Real Sociedad, uh, Real Madrid, uh, Atlético de Madrid. But the majority of the Spanish clubs from, from La Liga, Premier and, and, and Segunda Championship, they don't own the stadiums. The stadiums are typically owned by the city. So sometimes it is tricky and quite important, the relationship between the club, the owners of the club, and the city, the major. Sometimes, you know, having a club in a given city, especially if it's small, has a, a strong grassroots and emotion and element. So sometimes, you know, the, the, the state in itself and the, the run of the stadiums and the property can create tensions between the mayor and the, and the city and the club. But that has been a sustainable model. It's working fine. And, and I think that if with long-term leases, as is the case, and a, cle- and, and a very clear provisions on who does what, especially in terms of maintenance, which can be really costly for such a, a huge infrastructure as an stadium is, things can go well. And, and honestly, I mean, the issue now for Spanish clubs is not running the stadium, it's the stadium itself or being or not being the owner of the stadium, but it's about uh, how can I make take the best out of the stadium try to maximize the incomes from the game days and try to for the people to to go to the stadium not only on the match days but if it is on the match days that they come earlier you know i mean i i got a client who was really shocked i recall when we went to one big stadium here in spain and just before the game started like 30 minutes before all the bars surrounding the stadium was fu- were full also of supporters and we went into the stadium and, and the bars at the stadium were empty. So this client said, I mean, how can these guys not think about bringing all these people three hours before into the stadium and spend their money in the stadium? Well, this is cultural approach. And at the same time, a matter of how attractive commercially are the infrastructure, the stadium for the, for the fans. For sure. And the fan experience uh, aspect is also, as a club, something you must uh, consider as well, of course. Yeah, you mentioned some of the risks there in buying a team. You said the relegation, we talked about owning the, not owning the stadiums. What are some uh, upsides, you would say, as an investment to buy a club? Because obviously now uh, Elon Musk is buying Twitter for $44 billion, And I read he could have bought something like, I don't know, 20 plus uh, sports teams. But he chose that. So why should uh, someone who has the funds uh, invest in a football club? Well, I think because if managed properly, it can be a very profitable investment. And, and that, that is very clear. Um, I, I think that at least in Spain and, and in all the well-established leagues, the major leagues in, in Europe, I mean, including the UK and Germany, I think the football industry is sustainable, is profitable. And the standards for the operation at all levels are at the standard of any business industry around the world. So I would say that from the legal and the economic point of view, it's a safe environment. The regulator, which are the leagues in the case of Spain, uh, applies a very strict financial control on the clubs, which has provided to be uh, an extremely useful tool at any times in the times where the things go really well in the times of COVID too. So I think the, the, the model that the, that the Liga applied uh, has proven to be or to create an environment for investors which is really stable uh, beyond the relegation or promotion system. And on the other hand, I think that the room for, for growth in commercial revenues, the Spanish clubs are pretty much dependent and also I think in some of the UK dependent on the TV right income. Uh, that could be, let's say, 65% uh, 
in some cases, 75% of the total revenues. So that means that the commercial revenues have a, still a lot of room for growth. So that's opportunity. And if you have all the clubs and you have the, uh, the potential synergy between one sponsor for the two or three clubs that you own, or you can work on revamping the VIP boxes of the stadium, the fans experience at the end is, is try to maximize the asset that you have. And I think there's still uh, on behalf of the club room for that. And, and probably now the, the effort for many of the clubs are focusing on having the right team on board to maximize the commercial revenues from the assets. There's a lot of things to think about, obviously, before, and that's where you guys come in with uh, legal advice as well. Yeah. I want to go back a little bit when we talked about agents, because you are the third sports lawyer, if I'm not mistaken, that I have talked to on this podcast. One from Sweden, one from UK, and now you're from Spain. And everyone has mentioned this with the agents, that you are not a substitute to the agent, but you are an addition to the agent. Is that something that you are sometimes accused of taking over the work of the agent? Yes, that is, um, I would say, a barrier that you need to, to tear down in, in, in a first interaction with, with an agent. I mean, the agents, they know the player, the clients very well. They know the industry, they have the network. They know very well how to do their job. The point that we can bring is the legal advice, but not only when the things go wrong or when it's too late, but before. Let me just give you an example. I had a meeting this week with a couple of Brazilian agents and, and they've been doing business for a long time. And we were discussing about potential transfer and, and they said, what do we have to do before? I mean, is, if we foreseen that this summer there's going to be a transfer of X player, what do we have to do starting now to have the best landing for the player? And that was obviously to have the team on the side of the player of advisors, including the agents. They fully understood the role that we are playing. And for example, it was very critical, the tax planning of the player. I mean, you know, to, to exit in a good way, in a proper way from your country. And, and how do you have your tax strategy for the next three, four years in the new country. So that's the type of things that we can anticipate and that we can bring value. Sometimes when they call us, it's too late. But at the end, I think that resistance is changing because uh, I must say that the world of agents, it's becoming more and more professional uh, every day. And probably part of the new regulation that are coming on, on this stakeholders will move forward the changes yeah definitely and i've also talked to some agents and the regulations to become an agent has also become more strict which means that it's a more professionalized field and of course that helps as well yeah absolutely i mean if the if the industry is is becoming a global entertainment industry that should have ethics compliance and professional standards all the stakeholders interacting in the industry should meet the same level and reach those standards. This episode is sponsored by InSport Education, the online business school for sport. They offer a range of different courses, for example, foundations of sport business, private equity in sport, and much, much more. As a listener to this podcast, you get 10% off all of their courses using the code Sports Management Podcast 10. Click the link in the description below and sign up today. If we uh, move on and talk a little bit about your career within sports, you have a long career within Baker McKenzie. As you mentioned there, you started in 1999, but you are also a professor and a teaching um, master in law, applied to football and masters in sports law. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yes, that's that's a really nice part of my of my day to day. I mean, interact with students who have interest in sport law, um, and that is in, in La Liga Business School, in Unir, and in, in ISDE in Madrid. I, I think it's it's very interesting to see how I mean that there is a genuine interest from lawyers to specialize since the beginning of their careers in sport law. I mean, that was something that that when I started, 
that was not the case. I mean, there was not such a master's in sport law degree as you can find today. And so you typically go through employment, tax, M&A or, or corporate, and then you, you try to specialize. But now a young student coming up from the law school, he or she can satisfy the interest for the sport industry and becoming a sport lawyer and a specialist from the beginning, which is really good. But I always tell them that they need to understand, I mean, the basic for corporate employment and tax. I mean, if you are dealing with a club, uh, which in some cases in Spain, a few of them are literally and legally speaking clubs. Some others are uh, um, limited liability sport corporations. You need to understand how they work, the mechanics, what the shareholders meeting can do, what the board of directors is entitled to do, uh, what is how an increase of capital works. I mean, those type of things are basics. And sometimes you just jump into the FIFA sport regulations or uh, the employment contract of um, of a football player regulation immediately, there might be some gaps in your career. But it's, 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 it's uh, extremely exciting to, to, to have the chance to interact with students who have that interest for sport law. Now you're an experienced professional in the field, but how did your career in sport start? Well, it, it started by, by, by the interest that I had because I love sport and I love football. And, and I thought that the you know having been in a law firm that provides uh, a wide range of legal services and has this uh, global approach as a global platform fit absolutely well into the sports industry and and the football industry so so at the end is uh, try to convince your senior partners by that time being an associate which sometimes is not easy try to bring to their eyes that this this can be something profitable and taking from there is just to to kick it off, bring the first assignment, and and start doing the networking and the business development, which in that case may be different from the ordinary uh, client that we may have in the firm. It's a long and exciting career you've had. So looking back now, have there been any bumps on the road in your career, and if so, how did you overcome them? Yes, absolutely. And I think they are good, especially if you learn from them. And that's what makes what each one of us are, are now. Um, I recall, I think that the beginning of, of starting the practice here, I think that was difficult, you know, to try to share the vision and to, and to bring to the minds of the decision makers by that time that that was something that was worth to bet and to work on. And, and it took me a while. And, and the other one, just to give you an example, uh, I will always recall the night in which in a dinner between the seller and the buyer and the seller who was our client, uh, we had a deal to sell the club in a napkin. <laughs> so they wrote the final terms after a long dinner and after a long day of negotiations in the club premises, we went to a restaurant and that was it. We had it in a napkin. <laughs> okay, so we sleep over that night over the terms agreed and the buyer kept the napkin. And when we arrive back to the in the morning to the office of the at the stadium of the club, the seller said, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that this is a small issue here, which is Y and X. And the buyer said, this deal is not going to happen. It's not because of the economic liability, liability of this point that you mentioned today is because we trust you, but with this that you're doing now, we don't trust you anymore. Mm. So this is the end. Oh, wow. And, and the deal did, <laughs> didn't go through. And it was really frustrating as a lawyer, you know, working on that and at the end, not having the deal done, which everybody was so willing to execute. Wow. That's a great story. And I can understand <laughs> the frustration there. Yeah, yeah, I'm still coping with that. <laughs> and it was years ago. <laughs> I see. Approaching the end here, is there something that I haven't asked you yet that you want to mention? No, I think I think I think you covered a lot of the professional questions that I think would be probably interesting. And other than that, I think we covered a lot of ground. I'm glad to hear it. Then uh, the last question that I ask everyone is: uh, if you could choose the next guest on this podcast. Who do you think that I should talk to? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say probably uh, Maheta Molango, who is now the CEO of the PFA, 
the players union in the UK. Mm. He's been a lawyer before, or probably still a lawyer. You remain a lawyer the entire, your entire life, even if you're not practicing. But but he he moved from being a lawyer in our firm to become the CEO of Real Mallorca, and then moved to the PFA chair. Mm. And I, and I think he could be a good interview. Yeah, that's a very good name. I will uh, try to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. David Diaz, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Sports Management Podcast and share all your knowledge on uh, sports law and uh, football. Thank you, Marcos. It's been a pleasure and I wish you the best. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.